Recording for this meeting has begun. Hello, everyone. I'm just doing a very quick audio check to make sure that you can hear my voice. If a couple of you could let me know in the chat box that I'm coming through clear, clearly, that would be helpful. I see a yes and uh, a few confirmations that you can hear me loud and clear. That's what I like to hear. Great. Thank you all. All right. Good morning, afternoon or evening, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the CADAP Biennial Review Toolkit and its role in strengthening African country data systems. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLinks webinar host for today with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I'll be keeping an eye on everything, and you may hear my voice pop in, in and out here and there during the event and the Q&A session. Before we dive into the content, I would like to just go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. If you are an AgriLinks regular, you may be noticing some changes in the webinar platform, and that's because Adobe Connect just pushed through some updates uh, to the AgriLinks platform. And I'll be honest, this is my first time working with the updated features. So um, please feel free to explore the format and please excuse us if there, there are any hiccups along the way. You're welcome to let us know in the chat box if you're experiencing any difficulties and we will do our best to remedy them. Uh, so first and foremost, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, which I see many of you are doing. We always love to know who's joining us. And also use the chat box to ask questions and share any resources that you have that might be relevant to our audience today. We love for our webinars to be as interactive as possible. We will be collecting your questions throughout the webinar and we'll answer as many as we can, either directly in the chat box or during the verbal Q&A session later in the webinar. So please post questions at any point. Uh, lastly, we are recording this webinar and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources once they are ready. And they will also be posted on the agrilinks.org website. All right, we have a lot to get through today, so I'm hoping to, to pass it on and dive right into the content. So I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker now, Kat Howe, who will provide an introduction to our other speakers and also an overview of today's agenda. And Kat is project manager with the USAID Policy Link Project, and she is a monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning expert, and a collaborating learning and adapt adapting specialist with nearly a decade of experience designing and facilitating events that fuel co-creation and collaborative innovation among diverse stakeholder groups. And she will be your moderator leading you through much of the session today. So I will pass the microphone to Kat. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'd like to similarly confirm that everybody can hear me okay. So if you could let me know in the chat if I'm coming through clearly, I would appreciate that. Um, thanks for a wonderful introduction, Julie, and uh, thanks to the AgriLinks team for hosting uh, a wonderful suite of panelists to share about the Biennial Review Toolkits. Um, as Julie mentioned, my name is Catherine Howe, and I work for the USAID PolicyLink project. For those that are not familiar with PolicyLink, we are a five-year co cooperative agreement funded by USAID RFS. And our mission is to support individuals and organizations to work better together by strengthening leadership, collaboration, and learning, all in an effort to transform policy systems. And in our work, we often have the opportunity to partner with the African Union. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Simply Snuala. Dr. Nuala is the head of agriculture and food security at the African Union Commission. He brings over 30 years of experience in agricultural food security policies, program development, and implementation. You'll have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Nuala in just a moment, as he'll be sharing his reflections in the opening remarks. And we'll also be introducing you all to the VR Toolkit and discussing the evolution of the product and process. Welcome, Sim, please. Next, I have the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, Chris Shepard Pratt, who currently serves as the Policy Chief at USAID RFS. 
Chris wears many, many hats, in addition to previously serving as the Bureau's transition lead for policy and strategy engagement. Chris also currently supports the AU's Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, also known as CADAP, and currently sits on an advisory committee for uh, learning about the biennial review. You'll have an opportunity to hear from Chris in just a moment during the opening remarks. Welcome, Chris. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Anna Brennis who works as a Senior Data Steward and Data Support Specialist at USAID RFS. Anna's focus is on working with various stakeholders to build consensus on the best data management and sharing practices so that groups can most effectively learn from their data to leverage past successes and build on lessons learned. And you'll have an opportunity to hear from Anna. She sh will share her uh, reflections on how strong data systems can spur agricultural growth. Welcome, Anna. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Robert Uma. Robert currently serves as the Regional Director of the USAID Policy Link Project, and Robert is a multi-skilled development economist, researcher, data analyst, and facilitator with more than 15 years of experience managing and implementing development projects in Africa. You'll mostly hear from Robert during the Q&A session, um, as he has a lot of relevant experience um, with the biennial review that will be great to ask him more about throughout today's session. Welcome, Robert. Next, I will happily introduce my colleague, Pondelini Alago. Pondelini currently serves as the Program Officer for the Southern African, De Southern African Development Community Secretariat, also known as SADC. She is responsible for regional programs on food security, which involves supporting the 16 SADC member states, and sits with Chris, uh, Robert, and Simplice on an advisory committee for biennial review learning. You'll have the opportunity to hear from Pondulani, and she shares about stories where the BR data has been used to facilitate dialogue and decision making. Welcome, Pondulani. Last but not least, I'll introduce my colleague, Morgan Allaire-Rus, who serves as an associate on the USAID Policy Link Project. Morgan is the Tableau, Tableau developer behind the CADA BR Interactive Toolkit and is a system sensing and data visualization specialist. You'll have the opportunity to hear from Morgan, and she'll be doing a walkthrough of the BR Toolkit. So welcome, everyone, to this webinar. We're so happy to have you here joining us today. I hope everybody, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, your time has a warm beverage um, and that you can enjoy and learn something from our presentation. What we'd like to propose as an agenda for today is to provide some opening remarks and an overview um, on the CAT BR and our reflections on strong data systems. Then we'll share about the evolution of this tool and process and also do a walkthrough of the Tableau dashboard with you all so you can better understand how you might use it in your work. We'll also be asking your, you some questions about how you might use this toolkit. And last, we'll close with Q&A. So as Julie mentioned, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat throughout our session and we'll uh, come back to your questions during the Q&A session. And then we'll close with some closing remarks. So I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Sim um, who will kick us off with some opening remarks. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, dear participant, and it gives me great pleasure to be with you this afternoon at this AgriLink event. I, I bring you the greetings from the African Union Commission, and I would like to sincerely thank all the participants for their participation to this meeting, because this shows their interest in the subject on how data is being used to drive African agricultural transformation. You recall, dear participants, that among other commitments to transform African agriculture for shared prosperity and livelihoods, our leaders, the head of states and government of the African Union, 
committed to mutual accountability to results and actions by conducting a biannual review process that involves tracking, monitoring, and reporting on implementation in achieving the provisions of the Malabo Declaration. In this regard, the African Union Commission, the African Union Development Agency, with the support of our development partners, such as the USID and the Policy Link, have been working closely with our regional economic communities to conduct the CADEP biannual review process. It is no story that in January 2018, the African Union Commission presented the inaugural biannual review report to the African Union Assembly of Head of State and Government here in Addis Ababa. The launch of this inaugural report was an important milestone for Africa, and it generated great interest among EU member states because it shows the absolute and relative performance of our countries on the seven commitments in the Malabo Declaration. The second biannual review report and the scorecard was launched in February last, uh, last year during the 31st ordinary session of the assembly. And this second report builds on the effort of the first round and track the performance and progress of each indicator that shows the performance of the continent towards a fully transformed agricultural sector. Although it is recognized that a considerable effort have gone into improving the quality of the data reported by country with more emphasis, with more countries reporting from the first to the second biannual report, there have been more emphasis in terms of recommendation on the need to strengthen national data and ME systems to improve the quality of the report. In order to facilitate stakeholder engagement around the CADEP BI report and to enhance its use, the toolkit we are presenting today attempts to present the data and information in a user-friendly way. I would like at this point, on behalf of my commissioner, Ambassador Sacco, and my director, Dr. Godfrey Baigua, to sincerely thank the USID and the Policy Link for the support they are providing, not only for the preparation of the report, but also after the adoption of the report, as it is exemplified by the development of this toolkit. I would also like to invite other partners here present to join the African Union Commission and the African Union Development Agency in supporting the CADEP agenda at national, regional, and continental level to build back better our, our food system post-COVID-19 pandemic. With this, I would like to wish all of us a very fruitful discussion, and I thank you for your attention. It is now my pleasure to invite Chris to give its opening remark. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Simplice, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm pleased to say that USAID has supported the CADAP initiative from its earliest days, and we're grateful for the leadership and commitment of the African unions and countries from across the continent working to end poverty and hunger through CADAP. African leadership and innovation through CADAP and the centrality of country commitment and capacity to this initiative have fundamentally shaped the way that the U.S. government approaches food security and our global food security initiative, Feed the Future. And so it's with great interest that our group here at USAID has been following the biennial review and how it is shaping a shared understanding of progress across the continent to end hunger and poverty, increase finance, resilience, trade, and accountability. 
USAID is a resource partner to the Biennial Review and the African institutions that provide technical support to the process. We often talk about game changers as scientific or technological innovations, but I think we can safely put the Biennial Review in the same category as a game changer. It's a common language and reference point for development partners across countries and stakeholder groups. It's an opportunity to strengthen data for decision making. And it's an accountability tool for countries and their citizens to drive change forward. But the value in the Biennial Review is inherently tied to its use by these stakeholders and the broader development community. So I'm thankful for the opportunity today to introduce that, that we're able to introduce the Biome Review and Biome Review Toolkit uh, and their use. And so with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Anna Brennis uh, to take us deeper into this detail. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today's Iberlinks webinar. This is a real highlight of the this was a highlight of the February Data Systems theme month. Um, the CADAP Biennial Review Process and Toolkit feature many of the design components of a strong data system, including data ownership and stewardship, data sharing, inclusivity, and transparency. It's designed to meet the needs of a variety of key stakeholders. USA's digital strategy and data systems vision supports advancing progress in communities and our partner countries on their journeys to self-reliance. Investments in data systems that incorporate homogenous data governance policies ensure data quality, and increased access to data are critical to helping countries solve their own development challenges. Without them, progress will undoubtedly falter. Efficient, effective, and responsible data systems drive progress towards meeting the most challenging development issues faced by Africa, its member states, and the world at large. Strong data systems spur agricultural growth. USAID supports partner country endeavors to develop and adopt trustworthy, effective data systems. These systems can catalyze progress in agricultural development and spur growth. Data systems support locally sustained results, help countries mobilize public and private revenues, strengthen local capacities, and accelerate agricultural enterprise-driven development. They can drive change in the right direction and are essential for monitoring progress towards meeting the Malibu Declaration goals of accelerated agricultural growth, food security, and transformation for shared prosperity and improved livelihoods. USAID recognizes that without country ownership, data systems cannot be sustained. Ownership and commitment to transparency are fundamental components of sustainable data systems. The interconnected challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, re-emerging Ebola outbreaks, climate change impacts, among several other development challenges, underscore the importance and urgency for systems that provide timely and accurate evidence to track impacts and inform decision making. This evidence is critical to scientists and decision makers and fuels entrepreneurship, innovation, and scientific discovery. The CADAP biennial review process includes data collection, analysis, and learning, and demonstrates the commitment towards building trustworthy national data systems. Through this system, African Union states share data towards progress and pause and reflect during the biennial reviews to understand where they are meeting, exceeding, or falling short of the malleable development commitments. The data generated through this initiative directly contributes to strengthening national data systems through improved transparency and data governance, leading to better stakeholder services. Thank you again for atten attending today's webinar and the Biennial Review Toolkit. This is a highlight, again, and a high point of the AgriLinks Data Systems Theme Month. And now it is with great pleasure that I hand over the presentation to our next speaker, Dr. Nuala. Over to you, Dr. Nuala. Th thank you very much. I, I would like the participant, before we get into the gist of this uh, meeting, to quickly tr take you through an highlight of the second biannual review report. Uh, the, the Comprehensive Agricultural Development Program, uh, known as the CREDEP, is the Africa's policy framework for agricultural de led development. And the main objective is to reduce poverty and, and increase food security on the continent. Now, in developing the biannual review report, we, we needed to have a clear process. And the, the first thing to do was to agree on when are we reporting. The, uh, 
Malabo commitment is 2025. So we agreed to have, and this was a recommendation from the head of state, to have the inaugural report in 2018, and the last report will be presented in 2026. Now, the seven commitments of Malabo are fully aligned with the UN SDGs, especially the SDG 2 on ending hunger, and to the Agenda 2063 of the African uh, we want, and basically looking at aspiration one. So these commitments are fully agreed to this continental and global agenda. And you are aware of the seven commitment. The, the first commitment is a commitment to the principles of value of credit. The, the second one that was at, at the beginning of credit in 2003, which is enhancing investments and finance in the agriculture. The third one is about ending hunger by 2025. The fourth one on halving poverty through agriculture by 2025. The fourth one, the fifth one, is about boosting and traffic and trade of agricultural products and services. The sixth one is on hands in resilience. And the last one is on mutual accountability. Now, the biannual review process is an evidence-based and peer review and driven process. So its objective is to evaluate countries' performance in achieving agricultural growth transformations and transformation goals in Africa. During the inaugural report in 2017, we have the seven thematic area that corresponds to the seven commitments, 23 performance category, and 43 indicators. During the second biannual review, and based on the feedback we received from the, the various stakeholders, we increased the number of performance category to 24 and the number of indicator to 47. <clears throat> now, how are the countries score? To understand how are the countries score, you need to understand the, the benchmark. The benchmark here is the minimum score that a country should achieve to be on track. So it is a moving score. In the first biannual review, the minimum score was 3.94. Country needed to achieve at least that to be on track. And for the second biannual review, the benchmark is at 6.66 uh, over 10. And the third one would be at 7.66 and the last one at 10. So if you are below the 6.66, you are not on track. And if you are on above, you are on track. Now, this core card basically shows you, gives you an overview of the, the results of the, the, the uh, second biannual review report. And using the benchmark at 6.66%, you will see on this table that the figures that are in green are the countries that are on track, and the figures that are in red are the countries that are not on track. Next to the big figures, you will have some percentage with arrows. The arrows up in green shows the progress that the countries have made between the first and the second BR, and the arrows down in red shows that the countries have decreased in terms of their overall scores. Now, the second biannual review, we had 49 countries reporting compared to 47 during the first biannual, and only four countries were on track, and 45 not on track. However, 36 countries made positive progress towards achieving the Malabo goal. And the same goes for the continental average that has increased by 12%. This is basically another graphic showing the progress that has been made. And then as you will see in 
in this graph, you have the, the progress that should be made to get to 2025, and you would see that in 2018, almost all the countries are getting to the main line. The, the progress is there. We are not on track, but we are moving towards there. We are almost getting there, simply meaning the Malabo uh, commitment and target were not unrealistic. These are realistic targets that could be achieved by the continent if all of us work together. So this is an overview of the uh, result. I will not take you too much into this. I would just want to invite Morgan to take you to the toolkit and show you how these results are presented in the toolkit. Morgan, can you please take the participant to the next slide? Over. Thank you, Dr. Nuala. Um, <clears throat> I'm just waiting for access to the screen sharing. Just one moment, we're getting that set up. Thank you. Can you confirm that you can now see my screen? Not yet. It's taking a moment to load, at least on my end. Let's see. Um, if you click back into Adobe, uh, do you see the, there we go. All right. It looks like it's kicking in now. Great. I see your screen now. Perfect. Um, so Following on from uh, the slides that, that Dr. Nuala presented here, I am sure that you'll recognize some of the visuals uh, that we have in our interactive toolkit. In fact, the slides that Dr. Nuala was, uh, was presenting are pulled from uh, the PowerPoint, which is one half of our communications toolkit. So for the biennial review process as part of the report, uh, we put together a communications toolkit in two parts, one being this PowerPoint from which you've seen these slides, and the second being um, a Tableau dashboard, which is essentially an interactive toolkit where you can go in and play around with the data in different ways, um, exploring uh, the scorecard, uh, different countries by commitment, or looking at all the scores overall. So I'll just do a very small run through of some of the main features of the toolkit. Um, as we're going through, I won't be able to see your questions in the comments box, but please do put them in and my colleagues will be filtering them through so we can talk through them at the end. Um, and we'll have an opportunity also to uh, get your feedback on any ways that you might choose to use uh, some of these tools or any additional items that you would look for in uh, future versions of this toolkit. Um, so this toolkit was generated to cover both uh, the first and the second biannual review. Um, it updates automatically, so once we get the fresh data for the third biannual review, that information will be added to this toolkit so that you're able to explore all of the data across uh, three uh, of the binary reviews. That's six years of information. Um, so as we walk through, this is our homepage, our landing page. You have all of your links to see, uh, for example, the scorecard, uh, which we had presented in the uh, PowerPoint. The main difference here is we can also explore um, across different years. So looking at 2017 data, um, and switching to 2019. You can see the big difference here is in 2017, we don't have progress data because this was the first year of the biennial review. Uh, for the second biennial review, we have progress data. So you can see not only the scores in red and some green, Morocco, Mali, Rwanda were on track for 2019. Uh, you can also see uh, these green and red arrows which indicate progress from the previous year. Now, there are many, many different ways to navigate this toolkit. I could click on any of these uh, country names and be taken to that country's scorecard, uh, but I'll walk you through in a different direction for now. Uh, the second page of interest is the by commitment page. On this page, you can explore all of the scores by looking at specific commitments. You can see across the top, we have commitments one through seven, and I can click through for example, delving into Commitment 2, which is enhancing investment finance in agriculture. 
And here I can compare two years of data. So for example, on the left-hand side here, I have 2017, the first binary review, and um, on the right-hand side, the um, 2019, the second binary review. And here you can hover a over any of the countries and see their specific score in this um, commitment area. You can also see them um, arranged in a column here so that you can see in general, although there are fewer countries on track um, in the second Bayona review uh, under commitment number two, you can see that in general, we have much more circles closer to the top. And this is a story that's repeated further on throughout this toolkit um, and it is really sort of the major talking point of the second Bayona review is the amount of progress we have, even though we have fewer countries on track. Uh, so within this view, you can also filter. You could choose to look at um, just one specific uh, commitment category. You'll remember from the uh, presentation that there are specific categories. There are, I think, 47 indicators and 23 categories that feed into these seven overarching Malabo commitments. So here, for example, we're looking at only the scores relating to access to finance under the enhancing investment finance in agriculture commitment area. So again, here you can um, hover over each country to see um, which data is available. So in red, we have countries that are not on track, in green, on track, and in gray, countries that did not report on this data. Uh, taking us on to uh, the next page in the dashboard, we have our region and country scores. Uh, one item that you'll notice across the board in the top right hand corner, you'll see we have 2017 and uh, 2019 up here. And you can hover over each in order to uh, switch the scores over and see the scores for that year. Um, here we have sort of a selection menu. You can either you can hover over again and you can click and select the region you want to delve deeper into or the country. So for now, let's go into uh, drill down into see Mali's country scores. Now we're taken to uh, the Mali country score page. We see the overall score. We can see that Mali is on track for the second Bayana review. That's a score of 6.82. And we can see uh, the specific scores in the uh, categories that feed into each commitment area. So remember earlier, I was looking at the access to finance uh, commitment category that comes under um, the Malibu commitment number two. We also see um, some highlights from the report. We can see the key areas of strong performance, key areas that require attention. None of this is invented by us as developers of the toolkit. This is all pulled from the uh, Bayona review report. Uh, so those of you who've read that will recognize some of the items. We also have recommendations. So if you hover over the icons, uh, you can see what are the recommendations that the report made for this country. From here, you can select any other country. Um, and I think where it gets really interesting for me is we get to the country comparison page. So I'm going to click here to, take, to compare two countries and take myself to the country comparison page. You'll notice that we can also see region scorecards that are exactly the same, but at the regional level and also compare two regions. But for now, let's go to the country comparison page. In the country comparison page, um, I'm brought to uh, see two columns. Again, this is mapping across to the same as we see in the country scorecards. So you can see the individual commitment categories that feed into the uh, seven Malabo commitment areas. Here I can select two countries. You can see here we're comparing Angola score to Burkina Faso and also two years. So maybe here it'd be more interesting to compare 2019 to 2019. Now, as a use case, what's exciting here is we see um, in terms of as a tool for advocacy or as a tool for members of different departments of agriculture to be able to go into the toolkit, select their country and then compare their scores to countries that might be similar to them in some areas or different to them in others. And think about, oh, like we have a different score here. Perhaps I could learn from the way that Burkina Faso are working on uh, their commitment to cadap based cooperation, partnership and alliance. Um, so this is, I think, the tool that uh, I find most interesting within this toolkit. Uh, taking ourselves back to the region scores, I'm really speeding through here um, so that we can fit this in. 
uh, we can do the same at the regional level. So if I click on the region, I'm taken to North Africa. And again, I can go to the compare to region section. And it's the same again here. You can compare two regions um, across different years if you want. Or look at the same region across different years. So you can see again, although there are fewer areas where so Southern Africa is on track, the scores overall are increasing. Moving forward to the All Scores page. On this page, uh, mapping across to the visual we saw in the PowerPoints, um, you can see each circle it represents a country. Here I have them arranged from left to right in alphabetical order. So the, the order themselves from left to right is arbitrary, alphabetical. Uh, but uh, the score is on the y-axis. So the higher the bubble, the higher the score. And looking across, we have in the first section uh, the scores for the first binary review. So you can see Rwanda. This is a race uh, taking the lead. We've got Ethiopia, Burundi down here, Ethiopia. And as you hover over, uh, you'll also notice in the second square, this is our BR number two, the benchmark has moved. So our benchmark for BR number one was 3.94. Now it's 3.66. So we have fewer countries above the benchmark. But you can see there's this general progression of bubbles and countries <laughs> um, towards higher scores. Now we've tried to show this visually. So the bigger the circle, the more change there is and difference from the previous BR. And so, for example, you can see Angola, although we're not on track for BR number two, we have a an 120 percent increase on their score from BR one. So that's a change to be celebrated. Ghana as well, 70 percent increase. Although Rwanda might be still in the lead, we have a difference from the first BR of only 18.7 percent. And so we start to be able to t really tell the story of progression between the different Bayona reviews. Now, as uh, we get more data, we'll be able to show this in a more progressive way. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, uh, a, another data visualization expert. Um, his name is Hans, and he presents um, some bubble charts where the bubbles move across time. Uh, that's where we're aiming for with these bubbles. But for now, because we only have two years, it makes sense to show them side by side. So you can see the difference really quickly, really visually. Here again, we have lots of filters. So we can isolate a particular region um, and a specific commitment area if we want. So if we look at only uh, boosting into African trade. And so here it becomes really exciting to be able to look at specific countries and how they're moving across from BR1 through to BR2. The final page uh, is our info and resources page. Here we have a summary of a small number of resources that are most relevant to the Cadat BR toolkit. You can download the Bayona Review PowerPoint presentation from which um, Dr. Naola had pulled his slides. Um, and that has um, really clear, it's almost, it's a standalone tool. It has uh, presentations and slides that represent each page um, and all of the same information as you see in, in the interactive toolkit. Um, in a distilled way that's really easy to present. Um, and also there you have country scorecards for every country um, in the African Union, as well as the regional scorecards. We also have a link to the Bayona Review um, and also to the interactive Bayona Review toolkit in French. Um, the, our um, ambition is to be able to provide this toolkit in uh, all four languages of the African Union. For now it's available in French and in English. Uh, we also have the Africa Agricultural Transformation Scorecard linked and the Compendium on Malabo Declaration and the um, NSA value added BR toolkit. So I'll stop sharing now to pull myself back to the main screen um, and be able to see some of the comments in the chat. I'm sad. I heard that there were a lot going on and I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, see them as I was going. Um, no problem, Morgan. Uh, Robert has actually been doing an incredible job of providing some succinct answers in the chat, and we've also been collecting some to ask during the Q&A period. 
I'm just scanning through to see if there's anything urgent um, to ask you based on the toolkit as you displayed it. Um, I think most of the kind of clarifying questions were answered directly in the chat. Excellent. I'm, I'm getting yeah, a loading page. As I'm, I'm trying to come back to the PowerPoint presentation. I'm just getting a loading page. So let's see. Uh, let's see. It should. Hopefully it will load for you Here shortly. We go. Let's <clears> see. <throat> I'm. There we go. OK, so now it's my turn to ask questions of yourselves. Um, how would you use the BR toolkit, how could you use it in your own work, in your own work? Um, and how would you seek to use it in the future now that you know about it? Um, there's also a great time to share any reactions to what you've seen. Um, and you know, it may be that there are completely different items that you didn't see in the dashboard itself that you'd be looking for. So please, everyone, do share your ideas in the chat for how you might use this toolkit. I can see that a number of people are typing. And also lots of good questions coming in. And um, as those can see, we do have a link at the bottom of the screen uh, directly to the toolkit. And so this should help um, anyone find it and be able to access the data. Um, so perhaps we uh, should move along as people are putting their comments and questions into the chat box. And um, Morgan, or I, I don't know if you might be able to answer the question that just came in about whether the toolkit will allow individuals to see the results at the indicator level. For example, food yeah, safety the, has three distinct indicators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at this stage, the toolkit brings us down to the um, category level, which is just one level above indicator. Uh, but something that uh, we see as in it's an easy addition um for the third br as this is something we're often asked is to see the indicator level is to show an indicator indicator break level breakdown um at the all scores page um in the other pages it gets very sort of complicated to go down to that level and isn't necessarily very very useful but for comparing across years um and at that all score level it feels really um would be really valuable to add that extra granularity but for now, as I say, it goes down to the category level only. Great, thank you. And I also see that David just asked, um, when will 2021 data, I think, I think that's what he's asking, be in the toolkit, considering that this is the third biennial review. Um, I believe the data is coming in um, in later this year. And as soon as the, uh, so the data comes in through a process called the EBR, um, which is uh, a process and a tool um, carried forward by IFPRI in partnership with the African Union. And uh, once that data is all collected um, and ready to move forward, uh, then it takes us about, um, two weeks, three weeks to get it into the toolkit itself. Great, excellent. Uh, why don't we move ahead and then we can come back to as many of these questions as we can um, after the next presentation. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Morgan, now that uh, uh, most of our participants have now seen and learned a little bit about uh, the toolkit, 
how, what it entails and uh, what can it be used for. Uh, let me allow me just to give you some few examples on uh, how data has been used so far. Um, I'll give you one example from a more uh, regional perspective, and then uh, we'll also give you two other examples from uh, country specific, of which will be Malawi and Niger. Um, from the regional side of things, for instance, for Southern Africa, uh, what they have done then is that uh, the heads of states for 16 member states sits annually every month in August. Uh, because of the necessity and the importance of the Malabo Declaration, they have then decided that that agenda should be a standing agenda in all their meetings. That simply then entails to say that they are ensuring that the heads of states of all their 16 countries are able to actively participate. They are able to do a dialogue, not only at the regional level, but that when they go back home, they are held accountable for to ensure that all the aspects that pertains to agriculture and food production are part and parcel of their national programming. This by large has we have realized that it has improved a lot of you know, policy revision in the various member states, as well as um, the uh, development of uh, uh, national uh, agricultural investment plans, uh, supported, of course, by various uh, uh, stakeholders within the African continent. Now, uh, from the country specific, and again here we are, uh, I have seen some of the charts, it's all talking about research, research, we would want to use the toolkit for research uh, so that we can detail uh, the data. Uh, not only is it for research, but also most importantly for our member states, we are seeing that this for one, brings out some practices that will be able to improve not only that particular country, but also lessons learning from others. We're giving you an example of Malawi. The, the 2017 BR results actually pointed out the need for improving overall, you know, data coverage and quality. And this is not only in Malawi, but across all the countries in the African continent, I would say. But for Malawi specifically, the Minister of Agriculture went ahead and decided to develop what you would call uh, data clusters across all the seven commitments. With those clusters, it simply meant that they had leads for countries' experts in all the different commitments, spearheading specifically the data collection and reporting. As you, again, as I had earlier on indicated, is because it was clearly the data had pointed out that they need to improve their data coverage. But all in all, what is most even most important for you to realize is that at the policy level, this has actually pushed the government to review some of their key policies, such as uh, um, the fertilizer bill for Malawi has been uh, 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 updated, uh, policies that talks to uh, uh, the seed bill, as well as the most important agricultural extension and advisory strategy. So countries are able to really take some of these best practices, uh, the use of the data, and do some intervention at both technical as well as policy level. Uh, now, moving on to nature, while well, as for Malawi, we're talking about uh, how it changed the whole uh, 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 review of uh, various policies. Uh, again, the, the first inaugural uh, results pointed out for Niger that they were lagging behind, specifically on the investment finance. And for that, just because of that, they were able, for one, to create an agency for the promotion of uh, uh, private investment and strategic a project, and also secondly, they were actually able to pass a law in 2018 for the PPP, what we call a, a public-private partnership, of which that was able to really govern and motivate how data should be analyzed in the country, and most importantly, also had refocused on more investment towards uh, agriculture with specific key to the Malabo Declaration commitments that we would want to see how we could improve this course across the board. Overall, 
It is clear, evidently, though there is still room for improvement, but the BR data is able actually to support and review national data collection and protocols. We have seen specific countries that currently are actually uh, either developing or upgrading their monitoring and evaluation system, as you are all aware that uh, without a very good uh, MNE system, uh, not much can happen. Indeed, from on, at the second uh, BR, we have observed that countries that has robust MNE systems were able to better report on the BR. Uh, also, most importantly, is to say that the data has done nothing else but it keeps on influencing the development of new policy initiatives, particularly at the national levels. And this is something that we would want to see. Lastly, I also wish to indicate that with the improvement of the ME systems, this does not only support the Malabo Declaration, but it would be it's actually able to support all the other interventions, be it indicators that talk to SDGs, because then they are able to collect all this information at one, though it will be split in the various uh, platforms that need to be submitted, as well as other national uh, uh, processes that would support agricultural transformation. Uh, thank you very much, and over to you, Kat. Thanks so much, Pandavini. So I think I will actually... Oops, sorry, go ahead, Julie, yeah, go ahead. just passing it over to you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, we noticed that Kat um, earlier in the presentation was having uh, a bit of microphone trouble, and so uh, she and I have both been triaging your questions behind the scenes, and I will be asking them during this Q&A period. So thanks to our participants for the excellent questions and comments in the chat. Uh, it's been really interesting to see, and we've tried to answer some along the way. But now we have about half an hour to dive into your questions uh, for some discussion. So I will take it back to some of the questions that came in a bit earlier in the presentation. And I think I will start with one to Robert from Romao Xavier, who asked, is the biannual report an instrument for accountability and support to countries? Or is it just a sharing instrument? If countries are off track, are they made accountable or do they get any support from the African Union to allow them to speed up their indicators? Um, thank you very much, uh, Julie. And thank you for that question, Romao. I hope you can all hear me clearly as it's the first time I'm speaking. Um, it's a very good question and, and one that's at the heart of this whole process. The, the BR, the biennial review uh, process and report, because the report is just the end result of a process, uh, is, is really designed to be a mutual accountability tool. It's not just something that is de developed for sharing, but it's designed so that there is mutual accountability at different levels. First of all, mutual accountability needs to happen at country level where the data is shared and discussed in meetings and used to influence policy choices and investment choices within the country but importantly to track amongst stakeholders the the performance of that country in terms of achieving uh, the malabo declaration goals of agricultural transformation um, but also the mutual accountability flows into the regional level and Panduleni just spoke about how at SADAC level and SADAC is a Southern Africa a regional economic community in Africa here that has now taken these reports to its high level meetings and ministers meet and even heads of state and are presented with these results and they ask questions uh, of themselves. Why are we performing the way we are performing? And finally, there is a, a, a summit every year. It's usually in February, so please can talk more competently about this, where heads of state are presented with this report. And there's supposed to be some peer uh, accountability amongst the countries to, to see where they are and why they are not performing as well as they are. And within that process, there is a reward. In fact, uh, last this year, uh, they, they were last year in the in the last report 
the some countries got uh, some awards for good performance for countries as a way of encouraging uh, the better performance and within the report there are recommendations for improvement so in short yes uh, this is more than just a, an exercise in developing a report um, over to you uh, julie thanks so much robert and i also wanted to note that uh, pendulini added in the chat uh, that it is indeed by and large there to help with mutual accountability. Hence the commitment of SADC to include it as a standing agenda item so that heads of state are held accountable. So excellent, thank you for those responses. I will uh, pull up a, a couple of questions to go to you, Pendulini. From One from Indra Klein who asked or said that given the impact of COVID-19 and the uncertainty of variants, to what degree will countries' goals be impacted? And Richard Goodman asked a related question, do you take into consideration unexpected challenges like COVID or perhaps like fall armyworm? How are those incorporated? Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, we are in the very, very new normal. Uh, currently, we are just uh, uh, soon to take through uh, the member states uh, to prepare them for collection of data for the third biannual. Um, surely, the aspect of uh, uh, COVID restrictions and its implications will be taken into account, uh, uh, as well as uh, issues of pests and diseases. Those are always taken into account because um, they have a very, very negative effect on our agricultural food production. Um, the way the EBR is set up when the countries are inputting their data results, those challenges are also included into the reporting of which by the time we get to the scoring, we will be able to have some kind of uh, uh, reasoning as to why perhaps uh, this specific country has not uh, done so well and why this other one has done better. So definitely the quick answer is to say that all these are taken into uh, consideration, including into the BR system where the data information is captured. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. I will address the next question to Simplice, and it is from Krista Jacobs, who asks, how is the African Union supporting countries' data systems to generate or improve the data needed for the scorecard, especially for indicators on women's and youth's engagement and empowerment in agricultural systems? Uh, th thank you very much uh, for, uh, for the question. I think the, the issues of gender data related to gender empowerment has been a challenge throughout the first and the second biannual cycle. But for the third cycle, we have been working, with, we are working with IFPRI to try to support countries during data collection for, so that we can have data on gender uh, empowerment. This has been a challenge and we are trying to address this with uh, the support of uh, IFPRI. Over. Thanks, and please. And let's see, we've had a number of questions come in that I, think are, in that I think are probably most appropriate to be addressed to you. Uh, so I'll ask you a couple more while I have you. Uh, let's see. So uh, Caroline Smith DeWall asked Is the AU capturing best practices to inform and help governments improve their scores? Yes. In, in terms of the AU capturing the, the best practice. This is done basically by the regional economic communities when the report is released. And as uh, Pandoloni has just explained, they organize at regional level, they engage member states on the recommendations of the report. And during this engagement, member states get to learn uh, from each other what are the lessons, what are the best practice. What is missing now is this cross-regional uh, peer learning that we are thinking to start with the, the third BR. We were supposed to do it uh, with the second BR, but with the pandemic, 
it, it was simply impossible. But at regional level, uh, the regional economic communities, after the release of the report, they engaged their member states on the recommendation of the report and also on, on the peer learning uh, systems. Over. Great, thank you. And uh, at the moment, I think I will toss one more question to you, Simplis, um, from Gert John Studs who asked, can we access the methodology behind the data somewhere? It would be helpful to know what is and isn't included in certain indicators. And I think that question reflects a few other comments and questions I saw in the chat. People are just hungry for more information about exactly how uh, these indicators were crafted, you know, what, um, yeah, what methodology goes into the indicators. Uh, uh, thank you. I think I, I, I would like, because I saw a lot of questions related to, to data and the, con the, the confidence that we, we have uh, in the data that is collected. Uh, Robert had, has explained that. We have a team made of institutions that support the process. And the experts from these institutions, they are the ones agreeing on the data to be collected and the methodology to analyze the data to get the indicators. So if someone is interested in knowing what is behind, he may like to join the, 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 the BR uh, technical working groups. Then he will see what is behind the indicators in terms of the methodology. The confidence of the data, all the data are provided by the member states they provide the source of the data that they are submitting through the EBR and also they sign off when they submit the data. And who signed off is the, pers the permanent secretary, at least in the Ministry of Agriculture, who signed off of, of the data that is submitted. So in terms of confidence, we are confident of the data that are submitted because we have the sources, you can go back and cross check and most of these data are somehow data that are already collected. Maybe this is related to the question of the cost behind uh, collecting the data. Most of the data are already collected by the, the UN systems and, and other institutions. We just have to go and dig the data and report into the BR system. So we are confident the data exists already and we have a mechanism for cross-checking once the data are submitted. And this mechanism involves cross-checking at country level during the uh, validation of the data before they are submitted, cross-checking at regional level by regional economic communities. They can question data if they see that some data are a bit outliner, they would question the member state and also these are cross-checked at continental level. So you have all these checks before the data is validated and put in the system for the scores to be out. Over. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your, um, your deft handling of the questions. Great, okay, so I will, let's see, pull up a question for Chris Shepard Pratt um, from Indra Klein who asked, from a donor's or funder's perspective, do you have any thoughts on how the toolkit can better educate donors or funders with regard to projection planning of need, either short or long-term? Thank you. So in, in my view, the, the results of the biennial review are a really important starting point for conversations with countries about their respective progress and what it means for them uh, in terms of their priorities and public investment. Um, we have at various times worked with other donors to talk about the biennial review and its importance. Um, most donors will, would probably be reluctant to have a shared uh, approach to uh, priority setting through the biennial review outputs. So at this point, um, as USAID, we're, we're more focused internally on how we can work with our missions uh, and the countries where they reside 
uh, to use a biennial review as that starting point for a conversation. I would say one of the more important things, as I said in the introduction, uh, for the biennial review, improving the quality of the data, uh, improving accountability is for its broader use and application. So for everybody on this call, it's really important that um, we try to find ways to use the biennial review and its outcomes in our daily work, uh, whatever that may look like. So for, um, for, for us, uh, that may well include working with countries uh, to identify those priorities and use that as the basis for uh, our collaboration with them. On a broader perspective, I can see um, development partners reflecting across regions and the continent uh, to get a better sense of where progress is happening and where it's not, and then talking about what that might mean for a shared approach. Over. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's see. We've had so many great questions come in, so we're, we're working hard behind the scenes to make sure that we can answer as many as possible. And if there are any that we can't answer uh, in our webinar today, we'll also do our best to ensure that in the post-event resources that you have answers to all of the questions uh, from this webinar. Um, here's just a, a quick question. Um, perhaps, Robert, you could answer this one. From Dick Tinsley, are you using the calendar year or an agriculture year uh, for the toolkit? Um, as in many countries, the agricultural year starts in October or November and ends the following calendar year. So a clarification on that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, I, 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 a very good question. Um, so if you look at the data that's being collected, there are about 47 or so indicators. Uh, across a whole range of uh, issues ranging from trade uh, to agricultural production, commitment even, and mutual accountability is also measured, resilience, and so on and so forth. And a lot of that data does not necessarily, in its collection, but also in the makeup of the data, does not necessarily correspond to, uh, for instance, calendar years or even agricultural farming season type of uh, but type of uh, periodicity and therefore this data is really a mix of, of different types of data there's also data that's collected even uh, biennially and some that we even have to extrapolate and fill in that's collected for example every five years so the whereas we collect the data every two years uh, most of that data is either collected annually, some of it is collected uh, in uh, over different periods, and they don't all correspond to just one or, or the other uh, period. So it's, it's all a mix, and it just depends on the data. But the bottom line is that the data represents the performance as at that point. And, and so, for instance, we are now in the process of data collection. Actually, training is going on of, of the trainers, uh, and also training will happen in the next few weeks uh, for all the 55 countries, and then they will start to collect the data. Now, it so happens that some data may not be ready for up to 2020, uh, may not have been uh, completely put in. So we actually then collect data across five or six years. In the six years, so if you think of 2020 going back to 2015, and next year we will have 2016 going up to 2021, or 2022 for the next round. And, and that helps us to fill in gaps for data that has been corrected, that has come in late and so on. So it's actually a rolling process that, that we've designed here. I hope this helps answer that, that question um, that you raised. Um, and, and while I'm on, there is there was a question about the Global Food Summit and how uh, this could be relevant to that. And I think that's something Simplice might want to comment on and how CADAP and the Food, food System Summit, that's now a big topic um, in many places. I believe it was Lloyd raising that. And I think that the idea of the Food System Summit is to kind of latch onto local processes 
that are happening. Uh, so for example, uh, what's our thought about how uh, our food system in Africa should develop? What's the pathway that we should have towards the food system that we think is, is best for us? And I believe that the CADAP process and the way CADAP has become quite holistic, it's not just about agricultural production, it is also about the environment and resilience. It's also about trade. It's also about commitment and poverty and so on. It's quite holistic. And so therefore it's closer to a systemic uh, view of, of, um, of food and agriculture than we previously had uh, in the first 10 years of CADAP. Uh, but I think that Simplice may, may also have some things to say on this. Over. Thank you, Robert. I think you, you rightly put it. Uh, as uh, the continent is getting prepared to uh, to the food summit, uh, food system summit, we, we have some clear guidance from our leaders. And the, the guidance is that we already have continental or regional processes ongoing, and there will be no need as to reinvent the wheel. So the position of the continent that is being prepared as a common voice of the continent to the summit will really build around CADEP and will be informed and will be informed by the recommendations that we have made in the various BR, that is the first and the second BR. Because if you look at the, these recommendations, they basically speak to strengthening uh, our food systems. So we will have a continental uh, voice, although we are having national dialogues going, but we will have at the end a continental voice, and the continental voice will be built around the CADEP and the, I'm sure the actionable areas to fit in the various work stream will be informed by the recommendations that we are getting from the BR. Over. Thank you so much, please. That's a very helpful answer. Um, all right, looking, let's see. I see there was a question for you, Simplice, that came from Francois Stepman, who said that the European Commission delegations need to assess the national food systems through tracking economic, social, and environmental indicators. The seven CADAP commitment areas and indicators can thus only partially inform policy. How will the CADAP toolkit in the future accommodate food systems indicators? Now, currently the, the, the BIA, we have to report only on the seven commitments. But when you look at the various indicators, as pointed out by Ro Robert previously, it goes beyond just agriculture because it touches, if you look at the commitment six on resilience, it really touches on issues related to resilience to climate change, resilience to shocks and the rest. And the indicator that we are using there is an indicator developed by FAO, which is the RIMA, for example. So if you want to track the food systems, and you use the BR at country level, the country profiles, I think you, you, you are, that will be doing justice because the BR process almost look at all the food systems, food security, you look at the various parameters, we look at issues related to trade, we look at issues related to job creation, and, uh, the, and then we look at issues related to post harvest loss. So there's many things in there you just have to look at the 47 indicators and you will be sure that what you are tracking is, I would say maybe 80 or 90 percent already tracked by the, the BR. However, when we get to 2025, we may get other recommendations from our leader to track more than what we are tracking now. And I think this is also the purpose of this exchange that we are getting to see what is it that you feel should be tracked and we are not doing it because we need to get also get this feedback so that when we go back to our uh, policy uh, to our leaders we do post the questions to them you requested us to 
uh, monitor this data to collect data on these seven commitments. However, there is a strong feeling from stakeholders that this and this and this should also be co collected to have a full picture. So if we have such feedback from you, that will really inform the discussions that we are having with our leaders. Over. And this is Chris, if I may add, Julie. You know, it's really important that as, as development partners, we move away from a construct that says that we know as development partners how these issues should be framed or what the solutions are. We absolutely need to move to a paradigm where countries and regions are leading on their own development priorities and direction. And Simplice, I think, has done a great job of outlining how the African Union and African countries are want to build flexibility into process like the buy-in review so that it can account for bigger ideas like food systems going forward. But I think we we shouldn't it, we shouldn't frame this as this system is not sufficient for accounting for what some development partners want in this space. The point simply is we know that development happens when countries and regions own that process and that's what the buy-in review and the CADAP are uh, and so you know to Simplicit's point it's really important that we're working alongside uh, the African Union and these countries uh, to build on the platform that they have and it's not just about the indicators it's the whole system and network of people that are driving for change together through CADAP over the past nearly 20 years. Over. Thank you, Chris. All right, I will pose a question to you, Robert. Is it necessary to align country M&E or data systems to the biennial review? Yes, um, that's a good question because we have now some experience uh, over two cycles. And what we have seen is that countries which have uh, more or less aligned their, their, their data collection for the biennial review with their normal other national data collection processes. Uh, and as you might all know, many, in fact, I would, I would assume almost all countries have some form of uh, statistical service, uh, whether it's the Uganda Bureau of Statistics or the Kenya Bureau of Statistics and so on. And these are designed to collect data that informs, uh, you know, policy development and other processes within the country. And that capacity uh, can and should be used by the country to also collect additional data for the biennial review, as well as, I might add, for the SDGs and other things. Now, what we have seen is that countries that are doing this, and I, I guess Rwanda is a case in point, are doing much better in terms of the completeness, the accuracy, uh, the credibility of the data than countries that have a separate m and system just for the BR, and that might all also be housed within a sectoral ministry, like let's say a small unit within the Ministry of Agriculture. Now, if you have a national statistical service that collects data from all the ministries and their ministry points of contact who are giving and feeding data to the national statistics service, it's a much better approach than, than if you have a separate process. That would be my view. We, we are uh, continually observing and seeing and looking at the performance, but this, this is the experience so far. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Robert. And so, allow me to... Take... Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Just to... Yeah. I, I think it is not necessary. It is a requirement. And we are working with countries to mainstream the BR process into their national agricultural ME systems. And as Robert has pointed, and Pandolini has said it before, we have noted that countries who have done that found it very easy to provide data for the BR. So we are really working with countries to mainstream that the BR process into the, their agricultural joint sector review process so that they don't have to be 
collecting data twice for the same thing. I just wanted to, to, to add this. Over. Thank you, some please. And we have time for one more question, which I will pose to Robert uh, before we move on to our closing remarks and polls. So thank you all for your really excellent questions and for also working to answer some of each other's questions. We will make sure in the post-event resources that our presenters have had a chance to read through all the questions and see if any additional ones can be answered. So keep your eyes open for that email with the recording and some additional resources. So Robert, I'll ask this question from Willie Mulimbi. The tool is great. Thank you, Willie. I'm sure data quality is linked to countries' commitment to use such a tool. What are the mechanisms to ensure that? What has been done so far to make governments aware of this tool? Yeah, thank you, uh, Willie Mulimbi, um, on the compliment uh, about the tool. Um, and I do agree with you that the use of data, in fact, we recently had a study that uh, actually confirmed this point that data is the, the the more credible the data the more accurate the data the more likely uh, uh, the targets of that that data uh, to use it and by the way uh, before i answer your specific question the data is not just used by countries we are finding examples of this br data being used uh, by, for example, uh, non-state actors like civil society groups who are thinking, where can we spend most of our time, either on advocacy or on some other processes? So it's, it's, it's used, yes, primarily by governments uh, to make decisions, sometimes even by private sector. Um, now, your specific question is, what are, uh, what are we doing to make sure that governments are aware of this too? This is a really good question because just next month, and maybe we'll have some seconds for Simplis to also comment about this. In the next few months, we have a series of meetings that are really national meetings to uh, sensitize uh, national officials and governments on the tool, the tool specifically, because the BR report and the data, they're aware of that. That's actually their process. They developed it. But this tool is a tool that can help them interact with the data in a way that is user friendly, uh, in a way that they can pull out, uh, you know, they can get visualization and so on and, and, and understand it across from the lowest person in the country right to the top. And so we have these meetings that are designed to present this toolkit and get feedback and help uh, individuals with how to access it and use it. And that's an ongoing process. Uh, in, as a matter of fact, this is a requirement <laughs> to borrow Simplice's ter terminology. We are actually re asked to make sure that this tool is discussed at country level and regional meetings. And this is, this is coming up. So that's the main way. And there's also some thinking about coming up with a dissemination strategy so that we can uh, popularize the tool and, and make sure that uh, people are able to access it and use it easily. Uh, Simplice, do you want to comment about the the the, the meetings, the consultations on the communication tools for the BR? No, no, just to confirm, because you have said it all, these consultations will be held in April, and there will be regional consultation, and we will engage all the 55 member states of, uh, Afri of the African Union and the regional economic communities, as well as the civil society uh, organizations in the countries around the tour. So this, uh, this meeting is planned, invitations are being sent to ministers. So this will not be only the technicians. We are targeting the ministers and the technicians so that the minister also should know that this tool exists. And maybe prompt sometimes his collaborator to use the tools there, uh, for planning. So just to confirm what Robert has said, this is on plan and it is in April. I think from the 12th of April to the 27th, but each region during a week. Uh, we will share with you maybe the, the full agenda once this is uh, signed by the chair of the Bureau of the Ministerial Meeting. Over.
Great, thank you so much to all of our presenters for your answers to the questions that have come in. As you can see, we've pulled up a few uh, closing polls. It would always be very helpful if you, our participants can answer these to help us improve future webinars. And then we just have a few closing remarks from Simplice and Chris. So I'll pass it to you first. Thank you very much. You, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit not happy because th this is a conversation that is so intense that is so that is so good that you don't want it to end but we we, we we have to end because it's a virtual meeting and people don't have to stay for long in front of their computers and i, I would really want to take this opportunity uh, as a closing remark to sincerely thank the usid and the police link behind and arguing behind this event because we, we are somehow getting the feedback that is required to improve the, the entire BR process. I think this has been a very engaging uh, discussion, very interactive discussion. You can see the chat and on my computer is almost full and people are continuing to engage. Please feel free to continue to engage us even after this meeting and we will be available to provide as much as information that you need to for the dissemination and the use of this toolkit so i want to sincerely thank the 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 the, the person behind this because we can't see them they have not been introduced but i'm sure uh, kate and morgan will uh, uh, congratulate and thank these people on our behalf on behalf of my commissioner on behalf of my director i want to sincerely thank all of you for your active participation and i want to wish you a very good evening or good afternoon or a very enjoyable day depending on where you are i thank you thank you so much thank, thank, you, thank you so much and Chris. yeah so thanks um thanks to everybody who has been participating so uh energetically in this this is a really important conversation and the biennial review has value in the context of country investment plans and um, country action. And I think that's where we want to take this conversation uh, in practice so that decision make, we change the way decision making is happening so it's based on evidence, it's driving towards results, and there's accountability in the process. My hope is that everybody participating today will find ways to use the buy-in review to inform their own work, their own perspective, and their own engagement going forward. I think it would be wonderful if we saw groups emerging that interrogate the buy-in review data around nutrition, around women's empowerment, and around other things, and use that as a starting point for a conversation uh, with their partners going forward about how they can make change on the continent and transform agriculture. So I encourage you to all get involved in different ways. Use the buy-in review data. Uh, the only way that it gets better, the only way that it improves over time is if we're all using it as the reference point. So thank you very much uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope to see you at future AgroLinks webinars. And if you'd like to download the slides before you go, they are available under file downloads on the left side of your screen. So keep your eye open for the post event email and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.